Welcome, everybody. My name is Jeff Gedman. I welcome you on behalf of American Purpose. Also, Frank Fukuyama with the backdrop of Stanford, who is co-founder and chair of our editorial board and guest of honor, John Bolton, who has held so many posts over the years from the Justice Department to the State Department, from international organizations to arms control, UN, and most recently, National Security Advisor. So first, John, it's great to see you. Welcome, and thanks for spending this hour with us. Oh, glad to be with you. Thanks for the invite. Uh, our pleasure. Um, it, bear with me. I don't want to steal valuable time, but I just have to tell John one story at the top. I can do it in 90 seconds or less. So John, you and I have been friends for years. And at one moment, you may recall, I hosted you in Berlin when I was running a group called the Aspen Institute. And if I recall, at that time, you were our ambassador to the United Nations. We, uh, you all, we uh, uh, secured the uh, Adlon Hotel as a venue, which is beautiful and central and elegant. But we got a ballroom that became filled with about a thousand people every seat, people hanging from chandeliers. And Ambassador Bolton came in and surprised the German audience because what one would expect if you're in Germany is a long speech, one or two questions, and then a quick exit with an entourage. Instead, what you did, Ambassador Bolton, was you took the microphone and said, I'm gonna speak briefly because I wanna hear your questions. And you spoke for about 15 minutes and you open it up to a Q&A from an audience that was skeptical, maybe even in some ways hostile, may I say. And you, you took question after question after question. And then after you left, a woman from that audience in Berlin walked up to me and said, thank you and thank Ambassador so much. There's so much he said I disagree with, but that he would spend that time with us and take each and every question for almost an hour and a half. We're so grateful, and it was really important and left an impression with me. So, John, you think I'm a sentimentalist, but I think there's virtue in that story, and I'm grateful to you for lots that you've done for me over the years and today being with us. So now we dive in. What we'll do is 20 minutes or so Q&A from me, and Frank, please warmly feel invited to jump in and, and add or, or amend. And, and then we're going to open up to the gallery. Hard stop, 1 p.m. Eastern. John, there's a legal case. There was a book. There was your tenure at the NSC. And in the last 18 to 24 hours, there's been a resolution. I think we should start with that news. Can you brief us on that and where we are at this moment? Thank you. Well, again, it's uh, it's great to be with everybody, uh, e even if only virtually. I think we're coming to the end of virtual Zoom meetings, at least I hope so, the sooner the better. Uh, but uh, in any case, glad glad for this opportunity while we're still doing it. Look, on, on the case, the Justice Department uh, dropped both the civil case uh, and the grand jury investigation that had been initiated uh, at really at Donald Trump's insistence. Uh, we said from the beginning that uh, all of this was just a pretext, uh, had nothing to do with uh, classified material being in the book. It had to do with stopping it from being published before the November 2020 election. Uh, in fact, uh, the book went through uh, what I can tell you was an arduous four months clearance process, at the end of which the senior career professional who has done pre-publication reviews for thousands of publications, uh, determined that there was no classified information in it. And at that point, the Trump White House stepped in and said, thank you very much. We'll just now do a different review uh, to come to a different conclusion. And uh, the fact that the Justice Department's career lawyers and others uh, simply didn't want to defend that behavior uh, obviously led them to the decision, the proper decision to dismiss all, all of this. So uh, it's now all gone. The only good thing I can say is that I'm sure the free publicity that Trump gave us probably sold a few more books, and I'm, I'm grateful to him for that. But it was an assault on the First Amendment. It was an abuse of governmental power, and it was a corruption of uh, the Justice Department, of which I'm, a, I'm an alumnus and uh, happy to see that corrected. 
Uh, John, uh, one of the papers, uh, and I forget which one, maybe USA Today, uh, suggested that you were considering a suit or counter a suit against those officials in the last administration that drove this process. Is there any truth to that? Well, what, what I said was that uh, uh, any of the lawyers who participated in this knowingly uh, may well have uh, uh, legal ethical problems. Uh, ironically, a lot of this case was prepared at the White House by White House lawyers and Justice Department career lawyers were told, here's what you're going to file. Uh, we know there was some number of resignations from the Department of Justice. We obviously don't know all the facts. But, uh, but from what we've seen, Trump made it very clear that he didn't want this book published. In fact, he was quoted in stories in the Washington Post and elsewhere uh, in early 2020 saying, that book uh, can't be published while I'm in the White House. Maybe later, but not, not while I'm here. Well, if it's classified, it's classified. It doesn't matter whether Trump's in the White House or not. So everybody knew what the what the game was here, and if there were uh, filings or statements made with attorneys fully cognizant that what they were saying was not true, that, that's a real problem. And uh, this is not just suspicion on my part. The attorney uh, for uh, Ellen Knight, who was the NSC official who did the pre-publication review, uh, uh, and, and the attorney was the first head of the Justice Department's National Security Division, Ken Weinstein, uh, wrote an 18-page letter describing what had happened in the pre-publication review uh, and describing also, for example, the effort that White House lawyers made uh, with Alan Knight to get her to change her story. Uh, and they said specifically that uh, these lawyers had Ellen Knight in, in conference rooms at the old EOB for 18 hours over five days to try and get her to change her story. 18 hours over five days. I guess they forgot the rubber hoses. Uh, and she wouldn't change her story because it wasn't true. So they went ahead with the case anyway and fired Ellen Knight. Jeff, you're muted. Forgive me. I suspect we're going to turn to this return to this later. I'm going to tell everybody later you'll be able to ask questions by raising your hand using the raise hand function or waving in the screen or put questions directly to me in chat. So more from the gallery in 15 minutes or so. John, let's move to foreign policy. Yesterday, the Biden-Putin summit in the run-up uh, in social media. You describe Putin as wily and well prepared. Uh, two parts to my question. Tell us a little bit more about how one, in your view, should understand Vladimir Putin as a negotiating partner or adversary, if you will. And two, the larger strategic question Putin's Russia, what is the problem or what is the set of problems that we're trying to manage? Well, I think Putin, uh, having been president or prime minister for, for uh, two decades or more now, uh, ranks as one of the most experienced and knowledgeable uh, heads of state anywhere in the world. And uh, uh, like many uh, graduates of the KGB uh, in the, in the post-Soviet era, he represents the, uh, basically the best trained bureaucratic elite that uh, Russia could come up with. So he's somebody who knows his own mind, knows his own uh, definition of what Russian national interests are, uh, and pursues it absolutely cold-bloodedly, uh, uh, but, but with great skill. I think over the years, given the, the uh, declining population of Russia, given its uh, a really anemic uh, economy, it's really a, it's, it's a, it's a one-horse pony, it's an oil economy, uh, Putin has played a weak hand extremely well. And I think he, he brings to any summit meeting like this a clear idea of what he wants out of it uh, and, and, uh, and, and how to go about getting it. Uh, I think when he faces American leaders, uh, whether it's his counterpart as president or, or others that he meets with, 
uh, he judges them very carefully by uh, how much he thinks he can get out of them. Uh, and I think one reason he welcomed this summit was that he wanted to see Biden in the flesh uh, and see if uh, any of the stories about uh, Biden's health and psychology were, uh, were accurate. Uh, and I think he wanted one other thing and he got, he got that and he wanted one other thing and he got that as well. He wanted the picture of the two of them sitting in that beautiful library in Geneva. I'd like that library while we're on the subject, if anybody can help me get it. Uh, uh, despite the fact there was no joint press conference, he is uh, in a picture as the equal of the president of the United States. To, to this day, I'm not sure what Biden wanted out of the summit. Uh, he, he and the White House went out of their way to set a very low bar of expectations, and they barely met that. Uh, I think despite the media hype, hundreds of journalists and and uh, hangers on heading for Geneva, that this is probably the least important summit between the leaders of uh, uh, the US and Russia, formerly the Soviet Union, that, that, uh, that has ever been held. So John, going forward, you, you, you've answered part of my next question in advance. I was going to ask you to grade our side, President Biden, and our outcomes from the summit. Uh, again, I'm going to do two part just to get a bunch of pieces on the table before we open it up to the colleagues in the gallery. What ought to inform how should our Russia policy uh, take shape going forward in a new administration? And then the second part of that, there are bits and pieces that you and others are able at integrating because there's a lot of talk about what's happened recently in Belarus. Ukraine is a point of ongoing concern. I think even as National Security Advisor, am I wrong? I think you went to Moldova. Okay, I'm right. So some of these things taken in isolation can look distant or maybe even obscure. There must be a puzzle to fit together. And if you were advising this president or us, what is our vision and strategy going forward with this troublesome partner, Vladimir Putin? Well, I don't think we have a strategy, and I don't blame Biden for that at the moment. I mean, God knows in four years of the Trump administration, not only did we not have a strategy, uh, we had a president who was often going in one direction and the entire rest of his government going in different directions. Uh, which he took advantage of, of sometimes saying how tough he had been, how many sanctions he had imposed on Russia, uh, every one of which in my personal experience was done getting with him kicking and screaming about having to do it. Uh, so Biden inherited, uh, I think, real confusion uh, in U.S.-Russia policy uh, with a, a large number of subjects that required addressing and required addressing in a strategic fashion. Uh, what, what are we going to do in terms of renegotiating or replacing the new START strategic arms control treaty? What are we going to do about Russian uh, interference with, uh, with uh, election systems and information technology generally, the various hacks and, and, and other cyber attacks that we've been subjected to? What are we going to do about the gray zone left between what I'll call uh, NATO's eastern border and Russia's western border? The three Eastern European countries you named, and then in the Caucasus, of course, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. What are we going to do about them strategically? What are we going to do about Russia's efforts uh, under Putin to reassert its presence in the Middle East, going back really to, to the early 70s uh, and, and the Soviet Union. And what are we gonna do about Russia-China relations and how we fit uh, Russia into our dealing with uh, the regime in Beijing that I consider the existential threat to the US in the 21st century? The, every one of these is a complex question. Uh, and uh, I think, I think uh, we haven't thought through any of them uh, effectively, and we certainly haven't tried to put them in, in any kind of strategic pattern. Uh, and again, I don't fault Biden for that. I would say this summit was premature and would not have bothered me at all if Biden had said, uh, you know, we'll address specific issues 
like the ransomware attack on Colonial Pipeline as they arise. But as George H.W. Bush did in 1989, we're going to do a more comprehensive review of what our Russia policy is. I don't think this summit is too early or too late. I just think it's the wrong time. You shouldn't be forced into a decision by the calendar. You do it when it's right for us. And as a result, I think this, is a, this summit was a missed opportunity. You can't have an infinite number of summits between Biden and Putin. Uh, and, and this one was kind of a butterball. Um, thank you. I, I'm going to uh, ask two more questions and then I'm going to open it up to our colleagues. My penultimate question, another two-parter uh, about allies, alliances, and NATO. Uh, how are we doing? Where did Trump administration leave off? And where are the opportunities and vulnerabilities now going forward? And the second part of that is your thinking about a post-Brexit EU, and also Germany, where we're preparing to see the departure from the scene after a decade and a half of Angela Merkel. Could you dig into any of that, please? Sure. Look, I think Trump caused damage to uh, a number of key American alliances around the world, uh, and, and maybe NATO most particularly. Um, I think that uh, it was certainly going to be one of Biden's main responsibilities to try and repair that damage. And, and I think we're well underway in many, in many senses, simply showing up and not looking or sounding like Donald Trump uh, is a home run right there. I think it is overdrawn for Americans or uh, 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 NATO members who have concluded that Trump represented a new tendency in American foreign policy. I think he was an anomaly, an aberration. Uh, I think uh, the sooner we get past it, the better. And I think Biden basically performed that function. I think uh, NATO can be a stronger organization. Uh, and uh, I think it requires, uh, I do think Trump was right on this point, as Barack Obama was when he called some of our NATO members uh, freeloaders free riders that, uh, that they should spend more on their own defense, just, just out of their own self-interest. But the, we need a strong NATO, and I think uh, Biden has restored confidence, as I think uh, uh, almost any normal American president uh, would restore confidence. With respect to the EU, you know, uh, as you know, I have long believed the EU is less than the sum of its parts. Uh, I was a supporter of Brexit. I, I welcome a, a truly independent Britain on the world scene, and I welcome it especially in NATO, where it can talk about uh, foreign policy without having gone through the uh, wearing blender of, uh, of, of EU consultations. Uh, I think the EU uh, is still behind in its strategic uh, analysis of uh, both the threat it faces from Russia and, and the global threat posed by China. Uh, I think Biden made some progress uh, on that score, both at NATO and at the EU summit, but Germany in particular lags uh, in its appreciation uh, of the fact that it, it still lives in a threatening world uh, and that we need to take stronger steps uh, to deal with it. It'll be very interesting to see how Europe and NATO react to the uh, what I hope will be the continuing development of the Quad in Asia, Japan, India, Australia, and the United States. It's a long way from anything like a formal alliance, but it's for pretty consequential countries, very worried about the direction China's taken. Um, and I hope uh, one that will have its influence on thinking in Europe, especially in a post Merkel Germany. John, thank you. Final question, my side, before we open it up, you all. Let's talk about global threat China, as you described it uh, for a moment. John, how do you describe the problem, the challenge, threat we face? Because it is multidimensional. And then, of course, identifying a problem is not the same thing as being able to manage it. And as you alluded to, I think this is challenging. This is not simple or given to formulas. Can you dig into this for us, please? Well, I think, I think China is, uh, uh, is a threat almost across the full spectrum of, uh, uh, of potential activity, political, military, and, and economic. Uh, I think it, it has certain uh, uh, 
uh, aspects that go to its domestic policy as well, which, uh, which show the kind of authoritarian regime it is, the, the uh, cultural genocide of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, the, the uh, persecution of, uh, of Christians and, and others, religious faiths inside China, the suppression of uh, the one country, two systems uh, uh, formula in Hong Kong the social credit scores for its own population, letting them know how well they're doing as citizens. Um, but I don't think it's an ideological threat in the same sense the Cold War was. I know a lot of people talk about China as the Chinese Communist Party, um, as if to recall Cold War days, that, that's not the way I look at it. These people are not Marxist, they're, they're certainly authoritarian, but, uh, but it, it's hard to see Karl Marx in their, uh, in, in their practices. Uh, but it's going to require, uh, I think, a very concerted effort and requires an awful lot of thinking on our part that we haven't done in a long time. And the United States isn't that great on, uh, on a grand strategy to begin with uh, to try and figure out how to deal with these, uh, with, with these many, many threats. And it's a huge subject. But I think if we ignore the reality in front of us that we've seen in China's uh, assertiveness uh, on its periphery, its, uh, uh, its massive military buildup and uh, uh, growth and capacities in, in, in new and uncharted territory like cyberspace, uh, we're, we're going to put ourselves even further behind the curve than I think we already are. I, I don't have any doubt we can catch up and get this uh, into a more satisfactory situation, but it's taken us a long time to wake up and uh, we're paying the price for that right now. Thank you, John. Thanks, Master Bolton. We have 35 minutes, you all, for Q&A. I have Fritz Heinzen. I'm going to give you the floor. And then please raise your hands or jump in and chat direct to me. And we'll get in as many as we can. I see Shirley and others. Fritz, you're first, if you can hear me. Yes, I can. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is a question I wouldn't have imagined a year and a half ago, uh, where with you here, I would have thought about talking about tanks and aircraft and our nuclear arms and so on and so forth. But with 600,000 dead and with 10 to 30 percent of those who had COVID now having long COVID, uh, the, the key question or one of the key questions to me is the pandemic. So I have, there are two things I'd love to hear. Uh, and that is how you think the national security community and the White House handle the pandemic? And then secondly, I would really like to hear going forward, what kinds of changes, structural changes or policy approaches, something I'd love to hear how you look at future pandemics and how to best prepare for those. Thank you. Well, I think the, the global performance in response to the pandemic uh, was very inadequate. I think different countries uh, responded in different ways. The performance was, uh, uh, was, uh, was varied widely. Um, with respect to, so that shows that we weren't, it wasn't that the US was peculiarly unprepared. I don't think really any, anybody was adequately prepared. Uh, in the United States, I think the biggest, uh, the biggest obstacle to an early and more effective appreciation of the situation and therefore development of a response uh, was because Donald Trump just didn't want to acknowledge there was a problem. Uh, I, I don't want to get into a, a long debate, although I'd, I'd be happy if people want to, about what the government was doing uh, in the early days. Uh, the, the NSC and others saw in early January there was a problem. Um, uh, as has been written, Matt Pottinger is a China expert, uh, was among others who, who took what he was hearing to heart was brought to the attention of the president very early. And all we heard was, uh, no problem here, got it under control, da 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 for months. Uh, even when he put in travel restrictions, they were very incomplete. Uh, and he kept insisting the virus is gonna go away magically in the spring. And, and it, it's just, the, the media have put together a long list of statements by Trump and senior people in the administration dismissing the pandemic uh, as anything serious. 
and I think that gave uh, the impression across the government that it didn't need to be taken seriously. I think there were other problems in the government. I think the CDC and the National Institutes of Health, maybe to this day, don't appreciate that their counterparts in China are not, many of them are not just honest scientific researchers that could well be part of a Chinese biological weapons program. And I'm not espousing a conspiracy theory here, but if you, if you don't acknowledge that 800 pound gorilla in the room, that, then I don't think you can have a serious uh, discussion of what China's actual responsibility was or the cover-up that I think everybody acknowledges they engaged in, whether you believe in the Wuhan lab leak theory or the wet market theory or whatever theory you believe in. China covered this up. China prevented outsiders from getting full access uh, and has not cooperated uh, effectively to this day, which has, which has impaired every aspect of, of the rest of the world's response. So what this says to me is that, uh, that the, 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 the consequences of this pandemic show uh, quite obviously we weren't ready uh, and we're not prepared to acknowledge what we were facing. Now, I, I worry about it not simply because of the risk of another pandemic, which I think is real, not necessarily one like this, but it could come from a different source, but I'm also worried about the fact that a pandemic can spread as this one did in many ways, the same way a biological weapons attack would occur. And if you were a state pursuing biological weapons or a terrorist group that aspired to have them, this, this is a terrible advertisement about how effective such weapons could be. And you know, I think we've, we've all long called biological and chemical weapons, the poor man's nuclear weapon, uh, boy, it's, uh, it's, it's even worse after this. So I think uh, uh, it really does require more long range thinking. Uh, and I don't think this is a question just of government institutions and structures. Uh, I think we've got to have a lot more uh, thinking across the board because the the, the, uh, the the fact was we, we did not have adequate resilience. We weren't ready for this. I think uh, it's, and, and not just in responding to the pandemic, look at how even to this day in supermarkets, we have shortages uh, of certain goods uh, despite the, a year and a half passing. We've had in society as a whole, a little bit too much just in time and not enough resilience built in. So there, there's an awful lot to talk about here. And, uh, I think the risk is that as the pandemic fades, and God knows it can't fade soon enough, I think for all of us, that our short memories let it escape. And I don't think we ought to let it happen. But thank you, John, thank you very much. Shirley, am I right? Did you have your hand up a moment ago? Yes, my mistake. Okay, um, so Shirley, I'm just going to say for the group and for Ambassador Bolton's benefit, uh, John, uh, all these are friends and colleagues, some newcomers today to American Purpose. Shirley is a China-Taiwan analyst. She's a Truman Fellow. We hosted yesterday Tom Ilvis and Tom Tugendhat, and Shirley joined me recently in interviewing for us and the publication President Ilvis. That's his background. Shirley, you have the floor. Thank you, Jeff. Mr. Bolton, it's nice to meet you and thank you for making the time. My question for you is, as, as we know on the continent, Africa, there is a wide, China has a very wide telecommunications reach. They, um, they are working with men, there's this MTN network, which is very concerning, working with uh, concerning um, other countries and their state owned telecommunications companies. We're seeing a presence of Huawei and ZTE based in these, these um, telecommunication companies that are owned by concerning country states. And so uh, my question for you is, do you see Secretary Lloyd Austin recently said that the cornerstone of America's defense is still deterrent, ensuring that our adversaries understand the folly of outright conflict. But we also face PRC gray zone warfare, which is the very ambiguous, opaque, way of engaging in uh, warfare, which is an outright conflict. 
It's, it's taking, for example, taking Taiwan's um, democratic allies, psychological pressure, et cetera, in so many different forms. And so my question for you, I know that um, you had put forth the new Africa strategy during your time with the Trump administration. Now that we're seeing the, the, the concerns around tech and China, cybersecurity, et cetera, do you think that the U.S. has... Um, has a counter to China's telecommunications reach across the African continent? Well, I don't think we have uh, yet an adequate, we certainly have not implemented an adequate response right. uh, to China's presence in Africa al almost across the board. I mean, our, our, uh, our governmental involvement is, is really fairly limited, some anti-terrorism, uh, counter-terrorism activities, some uh, traditional foreign assistance programs. But really, uh, what we were trying to do was, uh, was open people's minds to, uh, to, to the threats that Africa was facing that, that we just hadn't paid attention to for a long time. Uh, and you know you've got to give it to the uh, to the leaders in Beijing. They they have developed an extraordinarily extensive long range strategy. They're pursuing it fairly effectively, unfortunately, and uh, we're behind in it. And telecommunications is one of the leading edges of it. I mean, it encompasses a lot of areas, including in Africa and Latin America and other places, going after minerals in the ground basically uh, trying to absorb uh, as much capacity as they can and block out others. But telecommunications, we have come to understand, uh, ha has a leading edge role because of not, not just uh, controlling telecommunications, but the ability to get into information technology systems mm -hmm. that also access telecommunications. Huawei uh, and ZTE, for example, are properly understood not as commercial telecoms, companies, but as arms of the Chinese state. And, uh, you know, they have, they have had uh, enormous commercial success in Africa and many other places because, uh, like many Chinese enterprises, they, they offer uh, very favorable financing terms. It's, uh, it seems easy and cheap to, uh, to deal with them, often much more complicated at the back end than the front end. Uh, and, and even worse, Huawei uh, in particular, is a kind of weaponized enterprise, not just the hardware, but even the software, uh, where one, once you're locked into Huawei at the fifth generation level, there's every reason to think you might as well just send them a copy directly when you, when you send an email off your home computer. So, so the, the, we, we came to understand this late. I have to say, uh, e even when I was in the White House, we were learning things from Australia and New Zealand that were news to the United States. Some, some people, I think, in our government were very, very uh, alert and uh, quick to respond. Chris Ray, the director of the FBI, uh, uh, being one of them. That now that all my investigations are done, I can say nice things about Chris Ray again without people suspecting an ulterior motive. Uh, we have alerted, though, uh, the Europeans. They, they, they are behind us. Uh, and but they've made progress in Theresa May's government in the United Kingdom. They didn't want to hear anything bad about Huawei. Right. Uh, Boris Johnson's changed that. He needs to change it more. Uh, the Germans are coming along, but we, we're all behind. Let's let's you know. There's no. I'm not casting blame here. I'm just saying we, we have not been able to conceptualize the the extent, the scope, the careful planning right. of China's efforts on the economic level and specifically in telecoms. I think we're getting close to understanding it better. We're still a long way away from an effective response in the U.S., let alone elsewhere. Right, right. Thank you for your response. I appreciate it, Mr. Bolton. So, so thanks, Shirley and John. Again, thanks. I want to turn to Tom Koenig. I, I want to say a word about you, Tom, in introduction, but can you make sure that I did see your hand up and I'm not misstepping here? Are you asking a question? Yes, I have a quick one. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm just going to say for Ambassador Bolton and those who don't know that Tom is one of our younger writers and a Princeton alum. And Tom, you won't do it because you're too humble and elegant, but I will tell folks you had a piece with us yesterday. What was it? Uh, a review of The Age of Acrimony, uh, John Grinspan's new book. Thank you, you have the floor. Thank you, Jeff. Um, 
Thanks, Mr. Bolton, for being here. Just a quick question. You touched on it uh, a bit with Jeff, but I'm curious as to how we can try to convince, you know, the Europeans, the Germans of the threat posed by China um, to the US, to Europe, to the, inter to the international order at large. Uh, specifically, what are tangible, concrete, specific steps that say the Biden administration could start taking um, as this bipartisan, cross-partisan consensus is slowly starting to be forged here in the U.S. that we have to wake up to China as a competitor on all these different levels. What are some specific steps that America can take to lead on this front to try to get the Europeans behind us, to try to get them on board um, with, countering, with countering the rise of China? Well, I think... Uh... Uh, a, a perhaps a, a paradigm of how to do it is is exactly talking to them about telecommunications. And, uh, you know, initially it sounds uh, pretty bizarre to think that Huawei, which, which has uh, signage on major buildings in every significant European city, in, in fact, in Minsk, which I visited uh, in, in, 20, in August of 2019, uh, there were several large Huawei signs in Minsk, and I was thinking to myself, either they're just buying these signs, or Huawei is more present than uh, than we could have imagined. So, uh, but it was a it was a case study in explaining the nature of the threat, and with increasing success, uh, convincing the Europeans they had to take adequate steps not not, not to allow Huawei to become uh, at all entangled in their in their fifth generation system. Uh, I think it it may take significant a number of additional specific examples before the pattern develops. I think we may see the pattern ahead of the Europeans. So, uh, so uh, concrete examples rather than abstract argument, I think would be effective. I am hoping that as the Quad develops in Asia, that they can also be persuasive with, uh, with Europeans so that it's not just Americans making this case. Um, I think the, the problem, I, I would take Germany as the best example there, is there's so much commerce between many European countries and the Chinese that they're saying to themselves, oh no, uh, th this means trouble with our, with our businesses. And this was something that uh, it's, not, it's not an ideological factor, but it was certainly true in the Cold War. Russia, the Soviet Union had very little external commerce with, uh, with almost anybody. So that uh, the, 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 there were fewer pains associated with, uh, with a more adversarial relationship with the Soviet Union than there will be with respect to China. Um, I think one area where Biden might want to look that covers a lot of ground uh, that, it, that he uh, made some progress on in this trip is trying to eliminate uh, trade tensions between the U.S. and its major trading partners. Uh, because one of the things we do have in common, certainly with Europe and Japan and the United States, uh, is the extent to which China over the decades has profited from uh, the piracy of intellectual property, uh, making huge economic advances as a consequence, uh, disadvantaging their competitors across the uh, world of industrialized democracies. Uh, and many times we, we heard from the Japanese and the Europeans in, in the Trump years, why are you fighting with us on trade when we ought to be getting together to deal with China and the WTO and its abuses there, dealing with their theft of intellectual property? And Trump, I don't know, he just liked having arguments with leaders of democratic countries, I guess. And uh, uh, you know, he had some examples of what are, can only be described as bad trade deals that the U.S. had made in the past, and it just obsessed him because he saw the world in balance sheet uh, deficit or surplus terms. Uh, so I'm not saying give up on resolving trade disputes with friends and allies. They, they always exist among uh, complex uh, economic systems. But for God's sakes, let's get the priority right here. Uh, fighting with Europe on uh, steel tariffs, which, which Biden has continued, by the way, it is not equivalent to dealing with Chinese theft of intellectual property. So if we all agree on what the priority is, I think that helps draw us together and, and facilitates what I suggested a moment ago of giving the Europeans and others 
more concrete examples of, of the Chinese threat. Thank you. Very, very good. And thank you, Tom. Kevin Kosar, did I see your hand up before? Yes. Uh, hello, Ambassador Bolton. Um, Kevin Kosar. I uh, work at the American Enterprise Institute, which you used to call home. Um, there I study Congress, and that's going to be my question to you, a twofold one. Um, first, I see that you have a super PAC and you are backing candidates um, who are strong on national security. And I wondered if you could tell us about that. And then second, how do you see Congress being able to play a constructive role in foreign policy? Well, well, thank you. I have, I have both a PAC and a super PAC that I, that I put together back in 2013 expressly to aid uh, candidates for the House and the Senate who believe in a strong US foreign policy, a Reaganite foreign policy. Uh, I, I worried then about the, the weakness of Obama's uh, foreign policy. So today I worry about the weakness of Biden's foreign policy. Some things don't change. Uh, it's not because I think foreign policy is going to be a huge campaign issue uh, in many campaigns, although some, sometimes it is, and it depends on the circumstances in the world. What I'm really looking for are people who, when they win elections and get to Congress, can talk in persuasive terms on policy issues that we're gonna confront. And uh, I just don't think our professional political class as a whole puts enough emphasis on understanding uh, America's place in the world, how to protect it, how to advance our interests uh, so that we're more secure and freer here at home. Um, John, I think you're inadvertently muted. Am I unmuted? You're unmuted now. I would just say in my own defense, it said the host muted me. <laughs> so somebody's the victim of technology. My fault because your name isn't on there and I heard some noise. I greatly apologize. <laughs> I I'm vindicated again. What a week this has been. Um, I, look, I think that, uh, I, I think that the, 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 the founders were very astute in understanding that you can't run national security policy out of the Congress, that uh, they had had that experience in the revolution. Uh, the, the, the Continental Congress, uh, uh, you know, by its interference in, in the Continental Army, uh, damn near cost us uh, independence. George Washington came out with a very clear view, you needed a strong executive in foreign policy. That's the way the Constitution was written. Uh, and I think the, the fundamental perception there uh, uh, in, in, in the 1780s remains true today. You can't have 535 secretaries of state or anything like, like that. I think um, uh, how one works with Congress, how one deals with uh, the, the, the issues that uh, that motivate them uh, can be very important in strengthening foreign policy. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we pay enough attention to that. Certainly in the Trump administration, we didn't. But just to give one example on Venezuela, when we took a very hard line against the Maduro regime in favor, recognizing Juan Guaido as the legitimate president, we had close to 100% support Republican and Democrat alike. I mean, I talked to Nancy Pelosi, I talked to Chuck Schumer, I talked, you, you name it, I talked to all of them, they said, we're with you. Uh, and it was powerfully effective in convincing our European friends to take uh, some pretty strong action against the Maduro regime that they might not otherwise have taken. Now, you know, that's a kind of fantasy. It's not going to happen very frequently. Um, but I think it's... Uh, uh, it's important when you can generate coalitions in Congress that support policy to, to try and do it. Uh, now, whether that's going to occur in the Biden administration or not, I don't know. But like much else of the, uh, uh, of the past many years, foreign policy has uh, uh, become part of the polarization, the politicization of, uh, of our politics. And uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not helpful, that's, that's for sure. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, John. Now, now it's my turn to apologize for my tech glitches. 
I want to call on you, Frank. Um, I'm using an iPad, you all, and my head is chopped off, and Frank's head is chopped off, and Patrick Chamrell's is chopped off, and I haven't seen Frank's and Patrick your hand, so I apologize. I know you've been waiting. Frank, you have the floor. Uh, John, I have a question about the Republican Party. Uh, so I think that it's true that there's a kind of cross-party consensus about the threat represented by China, but uh, the Republicans have had this odd relationship to Russia. They spent the Obama years attacking Obama as being too soft on Russia. Then Trump is not just soft, but positively pro-Russian, anti-Ukrainian. They're all silent. And now uh, you know, people like Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley have gone back to attacking Biden for being too soft. However, uh, unlike China, there is a significant part, it seems to me, of the Republican base that is actually not just not hard line, but they're positively pro-Russian. I mean, a lot of evangelicals have found common cause uh, in the anti-LGBTQ movement. They spent a lot of time going to Moscow. And if you look at poll data, uh, there's a significant number of Republican voters that think that the Democrats are actually a bigger threat to American values than the Russians are. So my question is, are we just going to flip back to the old Republican, you know, hard line on Russia, or is there something socially going on underneath the surface that's going to erode uh, that consensus that Russia is, in fact, a major strategic competitor to the United States? Right. Well, uh, look, uh, number one, on the subject of where the party bases itself, I've actually been conducting some polls. I've done two so far with my super PAC, one a national poll, one a state-specific poll on New Hampshire, which I'd be happy to send to, to Frank or, or to anybody who might be interested, uh, that shows that, that not on the specific issue you raised, to be sure, but shows generally uh, uh, since, the, uh, uh, since January the 20th that Trump's support within the party is eroding. There, there are a lot of ways you can look at this. Uh, I, I've chosen a couple different ways and, and it's uh, everybody can judge for himself or herself. But I, I think actually Trump's support is, is beginning to splinter. Uh, we'll see if that trend continues. With respect to Russia specifically, uh, I think that uh, if, if we look at historic Cold War patterns, uh, the Republican Party, and I'll, I'll do, just do this post John Kennedy, uh, Republican Party always took a harder line on the Soviet Union than the Democratic Party did. There are some exceptions within party uh, ranks in Congress, but, but by and large, uh, it was the Republicans who were hardliners. And I, I think that remains true today. I think the cultural issues that you've identified, and, and there are others, but, but the cultural issues don't really affect the view of foreign policy when you get to the hard issues. Uh, I think Donald Trump uh, and, and Russia is the perfect example. I mean, there's a lot of competition for that award, but maybe the perfect example of why Trump is an aberration in American politics and American life, uh, joined maybe only by Rand Paul, who, who, who has uh, no affection at all for laws in the domestic American context, but loves arms control agreements with Russia. I don't, somebody will explain that the particular aberration to me at some point. But I think, uh, and I don't disagree with your characterization of Republicans, too many Republicans during the Trump years while he was uh, saying what a great guy Vladimir Putin was, that they just sat on their hands. That's one example of political cowardice among many, unfortunately, that, uh, that I'm glad we're away from now. I, I think most Republicans will revert to form. And what worries me is that most Democrats will revert to form as well. Uh, there, there's, uh, uh, you, you can see that uh, in the various analyses, I think, that people have made about what happened at the, at the summit. But, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it is a distortion that Trump caused within the Republican Party, but I think it's receding. So thank you, Frank, and thank you, John. Patrick, is it true I neglected you too? No, you never do, uh, Jeff. Uh, no worries. Um, since I wrote down my question in the chat, I'm going to, to read myself. Uh, to be uh, clear, um, how do you see the terrorist threat 
evolving in Africa, especially in West and Southeastern Africa? What should the US and European roles be? And is the fight against terrorism too much on the back burner now, now that the great power rivalry is front page? And if I may say, John, before you answer that Patrick, whom you know, is a member of our editorial board, he's with Stanford. And Patrick, you had an essay review for us recently last week. Could you say a word of what that was? Well, that was on the, the topic of uh, the relationship be on, and the, the tensions between Islam and secularism in France. And the fact that it's become really uh, maybe the leading issue in French politics. Um, Thanks, Patrick. John, over to you. Well, let, let me answer the question in reverse form, if I may, uh, and leave Africa and go to Afghanistan. Uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, exceedingly worried about what's going to happen in Afghanistan. I, I thought it was one of the reasons I, one of several reasons I ended up resigning from the Trump administration. I think this idea of direct U.S. negotiations with the Taliban have produced a catastrophic uh, agreement. It was catastrophic under Trump. Uh, who wanted to get out. He said it would be conditions based. It would not have been if he had won a second term, he would do essentially what Biden's done, just said, we're out of here. Uh, I think Taliban will take control again very quickly. Uh, I'm sad to say, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think so. And I think that the nesting of terrorist operations, whether it's ISIS or Al Qaeda or new ones that are not yet fully formed will, will occur very naturally thereafter. When you combine it with uh, areas of instability in Africa itself. Uh, I'm, I'm still not optimistic about Libya, for example, but across the Sahelian and uh, sub-Saharan region in Northwest Africa, but over on the Indian Ocean side as well. I think that, uh, that we underestimate the extent of the threat. Uh, there was, I think, a positive development within the past few days. There seems to be some indication that uh, Biden is going to put uh, U.S. Uh, forces of some kind back into Somalia. I think that would be a positive step. It was a mistake for Trump to take them out. But on the other hand, we hear France essentially saying that they, 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 they don't think they can handle their traditional role in the former French colonies without additional European support. And whether they're going to get that or not, I don't know. Uh, look, in the Trump administration, it was, it was nearly impossible to get him to think about uh, strategy in Africa or threats in Africa or much of anything else, uh, which is why I was happy we got the Africa strategy out at all. I don't know if he read it, but he did approve it. I do want to say that it was approved even if not read. Uh, so I think between Europe and the United States, there's, uh, there's a lot of work to do. I think the situation is more unstable than people realize. Uh, it obviously doesn't get a lot of attention in the United States and, and could well catch us by surprise uh, in, in a very negative way if we're not careful. So thank you and thank you, Patrick. So you all, we have five minutes to go, hard stop 1 p.m. Eastern. Here's what I wanna try. I'm sorry, we'll not get to everybody. Ken Jensen, Wolfgang Podzig and Mike Fox, lightning round, 30 seconds, just to get a point on the table and we'll give you, John, final words. If you can't do it in 30 seconds, just say pass. I'm sorry, it's not elegant or fair, but it is what it is. Ken Jensen, can you do something in 30 seconds? I'll pass. Pass. <laughs> Wolfgang Poitzi, can you do something in 30 seconds? You actually won 60 seconds. Wolfgang, are you with us still? Uh, yes. If I may, uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, China has abstained so far from all uh, arms control negotiations. Is this a shared interest to include China, shared both by Russia and the US, and how realistic is it to include uh, China successfully at some point? Wolfgang, thank you. And John, hold your fire for one moment. Mike Fox, who has just been accepted to the Foreign Service, who is co-chair with Sidney Lipset, of our American Purpose Circle of Friends. Mike, can you do it in 30 seconds? You know it, Jeff. Thank you, and thank you, Ambassador uh, Bolton, for joining us. Uh, my question is, how much is positive democratic modeling at home important to counteract the rise of authoritarianism abroad? I'm referring to whether it's uh, freedom of speech online or in the public sphere. 
or some of the state level measures that have been done in support of Trump's big lie. Thank you. Okay, well, well let, me, let me do the second one first. I, look, I think that uh, uh, one, one, of, one of America's greatest weapons has always been its uh, complete openness to, uh, uh, to uh, analysis or visibility by anybody else around the world. Whatever we do wrong, everybody knows about it. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure how much modeling we can do in a divided society. I mean, I think we do the best we can with the institutions we have. Uh, it's one reason in my PAC and super PAC, as I said, in, in response to Frank's question, I'm trying to help fix the damage done to the Republican Party uh, and, and therefore the country by Trump. Uh, and we did suffer damage from it. Let's, let's be clear. And in, in a lot of respects, you hear Putin all the time talk about uh, what happened on January the 6th, which is uh, probably the saddest day in American history since the Civil War. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure for the very reason we're an open and free society that there's much you can do in a concerted way to fix the problem. I think we have to act as citizens and people will draw their own conclusions. Now on China and arms control, when, when uh, I, I raised with the Russians uh, myself this issue of uh, what to do with uh, New START, uh, wh whether there would be a successor agreement, what it would look like, a whole range of questions I thought had to be addressed, but one of which I said was an absolute priority was that China had to be included uh, in any successor agreement. We are past the point of a bipolar nuclear world long since, uh, and China is a rising threat. Now the Chinese and the Russians said, well, yeah, that's, that's fine with us. We'd be happy to have them in if they agree. Now the Russians don't really believe that. They think that the bipolar US-Russia nuclear negotiation relationship is a remaining element of proof that Russia is still a superpower. But anyway, they said if the Chinese agreed, we'd let them in, probably knowing the Chinese had no intention of agreeing to it. And the Chinese, the Chinese argument is, but we have so few nuclear weapons, it's not fair to include us with you two big guys. So their argument in, in Beijing is essentially, let us build up until we have thousands and thousands of nuclear warheads too. Then we'll talk to you about how to reduce them. I find that unacceptable. And it's particularly unacceptable for the United States to try and have a bilateral deal that satisfies our legitimate interest with respect to Russia, even if you assume the Russians will abide by it, without dealing with China. We, we, we face uh, at, at least threats from both of them. And we need a nuclear capability, deterrence capability to deal with both simultaneously. Now, the Chinese uh, have gotten a lot of sympathy for the argument that we're really just a very small nuclear power. So I have an alternative to that too. And that is that the next strategic arms limitation treaty should be among all five legitimate nuclear weapon states, all five permanent members of the Security Council Britain and France have never liked being in those negotiations, uh, but honestly, they don't, they're not gonna be very limited anyway. They're smaller than China. If they agree to come in, China can't legitimately refuse. They may refuse anyway, but will at least embarrass them. Uh, and I think this is a way to get people to focus on what the nature of the nuclear threat is. Uh, it's not a threat from the United States. It may be a threat from Russia. It's certainly a threat from China. Uh, there may be other ways to try and rope the Chinese in. Look, this is not without precedent. The Washington Naval Agreements of the 1920s, very painful to Japan, and Italy, and the other smaller, quote unquote, naval powers. But people understood that, uh, that you've got countries of varying capabilities. If you, want, if, you, if you believe there's any chance of an arms control regime that works globally, which is what we're talking about here, you've got to get the players in. And that means China's got to come in. And if we just walk away from this, and if Biden simply negotiates another arms control agreement with Russia, as if China didn't exist, it'll be a very foolish deal. So words of thanks, and then conclusion. Thank you, Wolfgang and Mike Fox. Ken Jensen, thanks for patience. You're up first next time. Apologies to Daniel, Trevor, and Robert that I was unable to get you in. Tomorrow, for all of you who have time, 12 noon Eastern, we have George Packer from the New York Atlantic on his new book, America, Crisis Renewal. That's the abbreviated version. But to you, John, uh, let us 
supposed to, believe it or not, in person sometime this fall to continue and go deeper. Congratulations on the resolution of the legal case. John, you have a final word if you choose to say something in parting. Well, just thanks again for the invitation. And uh, Jeff, uh, thanks to you and Frank for this new effort, uh, really. I think, uh, uh, I think it's much needed. Uh, I think for a variety of reasons, we're in yet another period where we're uh, too inward looking in the United States. Uh, and I think uh, your, your efforts to get uh, uh, all these different subjects analyzed and debated is, uh, is much needed. So th thanks to you for all that you and your colleagues are doing. Uh, thanks very much, Ambassador Bolton. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Valuable time. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you.